In the year 1878, the Tory Prime Minister of Great Britain was a Jew, Benjamin Disraeli. Though to be strictly accurate, Disraeli was a renegade Jew. He had turned Christian. But I suppose if his destiny was contemplating such high office here in Britain, that change of faith from Jewish to Christian was even a necessity. Isn't it interesting to contemplate that at the zenith of Britannia's imperial expansion, the blood was not Anglo-Saxon, nor Celtic for that matter. Anyway, Disraeli addressed the British people. Her Majesty Queen Victoria has become the sovereign of the most powerful of Oriental states, India. On the other side of the globe, there are now establishments belonging to her, teeming with wealth and population, which will in due time exercise their influence over the distribution of power. I express here my confident conviction that there never was a moment in our history when the power of England was so great and her resources so vast and inexhaustible. And amongst the many other imperial issues that the Disraeli mentality was interested in was South Africa. That mentality hoped that all territories south of the Limpopo River, where the white boar the Afrikaners of today, or black African, would be brought under, quote, the power of England, unquote. And to achieve this objective, the Disraeli administration invited an imperial civil servant, uh, Sir Bartle Frere, to go to South Africa, nominally as governor but really as the statesman most capable of bringing our scheme of confederation into effect. Oh, incidentally, a confederation simply means a bringing together of independent territories. But in this Southern African case, it could be a decent Tory expression for conquest. That is, if either the white boars or the black Africans objected. Sir Bartle Frere, here in South Africa, reveled in his Tory-given opportunity, uh, but there were obstacles to be overcome, and he addressed the British Colonial Secretary, Sir Michael Hicks Beach. My dear Sir Michael, my mistrust of the Zulus is not because they are semi-savages, but because they are a military nation, and uh, Quechuayo's whole object, Quechuayo was the Zulu king, is to keep up their military character. They generally believe themselves to be invincible, and I do not believe that anything will induce them so to abstain till they have tried their strength against us and learned thy sad experience. Wait, well, uh, that piece of English arrogance begs a clear military question. And the answer to that question is the specific subject of this story. Who exactly were the Zulus to try their strength against? Well, as ever, it was not to be the Benjamin Disraelis or Bartle Frayers of this world. As always, it was to be the poor, ill-informed, and often blooded soldier. And amongst the soldiers that fate was selecting for this far-flung imperial role in Africa were the men of the 24th Regiment, whose regimental depot was here in Brecon, 
and who are recruited from the villages and towns of my country, Wales. And incidentally, that recruiting was not difficult because in the mid-1870s, industrial depression was in our land. On December the 11th, 1878, High Commissioner Sir Bartle Frere, here in Peter Maritzburg, South Africa, took irrevocable action against the Zulus. He boldly said, it is necessary to send an ultimatum, which must necessarily put an end to peaceful relations with our neighbors, the Zulus. Frere summoned a conference and in Daba, with King Ketchewire's chiefs, his indunas. It was held under this very tree. This is the same historical tree. And here, Bartle Frere's impertinent ultimatum was thrown at the Zulus. The main points were, one, the Zulu army must disband and the warriors must return to their homes. Two, all Christian missionaries in Zululand must be free to teach as they please. Three, a British diplomatic resident must reside in Zululand to enforce these provisions. And Sir Bartle Frere rounded off this high-handed command with a typical imperial flourish. Therefore, I hereby make known for the information of Ketchewayo and all the Zulu people that I have placed the further prosecution of this and all other British demands in the hands of His Excellency, the Lieutenant General Lord Chelmsford, commanding Her Majesty's armed forces in South Africa. But Lord Chelmsford was not totally confident that there would be a Zulu war he said, the only thing I am afraid of is I won't get Ketchewire to fight. I must drive him into a corner and make him fight. Well, uh, those servants of the British Empire, Bartle, Frere and Chelmsford, need have had no real doubts about the fighting spirit of King Ketchewire and his people. Sometime before Frere's wretched ultimatum, the British governor of Natal had questioned King Ketchewire's internal discipline in Zululand, which had involved summary executions. King Ketchewire replied, Why does the governor of Natal speak to me about my laws? Do I go to Natal and dictate to him about his laws? Go and tell this to the white men. The governor of Natal and I are equal. He is governor of Natal and I'm governor here. The ordinary British soldiers, the rank and file, did not seem to question the rights and wrongs of the incipient Zulu war Theirs was a state of terrible innocence. Private George Morris of the 24th Regiment wrote from Africa to his widowed mother in South Wales. How are things looking in Pontypool? I am much afraid that it will be some time before I shall see you again. We are under orders to proceed to Zululand and it is thought we shall have some hard fighting up there. We must trust in luck and the British soldier's motto, God defend the right. I suppose Pontypool is very dead now, but I hope trade will soon revive. Love to Maggie, fond love to yourself, I conclude, George Morris. And Private Owen Ellis of the 1st Battalion of the 24th Regiment wrote to his father and family in Carnarvon, North Wales. I was on sentry duty on Christmas morning from one till three o'clock. 
And as I was parading backwards and forwards, I thought, what a row there was at Carnarvon that night. There was not a sound to be heard around where I stood. The farmers who live in the surrounding country say that the Zulus will only be tempted to fight us Europeans once, and they will afterwards fly away for their lives because they have not the weapons which we have. This is the last day of the year 1878. Well, herewith I send my kindest regards a thousand times over, Owen Ellis. Of course, King Ketchaway and his people did not bow to that insulting British ultimatum. And so on January the 11th, 1879, General Lord Chelmsford, accompanying the central column of his British army, which included the 24th Regiment, left this small military depot and hospital here at Rourke Street, crossed this Buffalo River, and thereby began the invasion of Zululand. And as the soldiers moved into enemy territory, the band of the 24th Regiment played whatever music was thought to be appropriate. Private Owen Ellis from Carnarvon in North Wales wrote home again. We are about to occupy the country of the Zulus, inasmuch as King Ketchaweo did not submit to the terms demanded by the British government. It is now too late for him, as we are crossing the Buffalo River by means of pontoons. Sooner the better we march through Ketchaweo's country to the place where the king resides, viz. the Grand Crawls. After arriving there, the Queen's flag will be hoisted, and King Ketchaweo will be made into atoms. The English are attacking me in my country, and I will defend myself in my country. But I will not send my impis to kill the English in Natal, because both I and my ancestors that went before me were always good friends with the English. I have long been interested in the innocence of soldiers. Or perhaps I should say, often the ignorance of soldiers. A good missionary here in Zululand, the Reverend Robert Robertson, remarked, I am astonished to find how little both officers and men know about the Zulus, or even why they are fighting them. And, of course, that tragic dictum applies to our British soldiers to this very day. Mind you, there was a British military opinion of sorts. A Captain Henry Parr, who was with Chelmsford's force, simply asked, why should a petty barbarian monarch catch a whale be allowed to embarrass the British Empire? Huh? By January the 20th, General Lord Chelmsford had selected his next place of encampment there on the eastern side of that mountain, which the Zulus call Sandwana. The soldiers of the 24th Regiment immediately renamed it the Sphinx because it resembled the image on their badge which they had earned in Egypt in 1801 while helping to defeat Napoleon. It is said that some of those soldiers of the 24th Regiment were uneasy about the similarity. Uh, there was a sinister, superstitious feeling in the air, and it was also observed by some that Lord Chelmsford had failed to order the lagering of the camp, that is, placing his military wagons in a defensive arrangement. And a Lieutenant Melville, 
who was soon to earn himself a posthumous Victoria Cross, pointed out to a staff officer that in his opinion, uh, this broken ground that lies here in front of the camp was no protection against Zulus. And he also expressed surprise that there was no picket lookout at the rear of the camp. The staff officer replied, well, sir, if you are nervous, we can put a picket up there on the road leading back to uh, Rock's Drift. That staff officer was marked as a lucky man. He survived the Zulu War, and he afterwards stated, In all my life, I have never experienced so strong a presentiment of coming evil as on that day. Anyway, uh, Lord Chelmsford, after listening to the advice of various black spies, believed that the main Zulu army was concentrated in that southeasterly direction. And so early on the morning of January the 21st, he dispatched 150 mounted white troops plus 16 companies of uh, black soldiers to investigate, all under the command of a major Dartnell. They traveled uh, about 10 miles. With this reconnoitering force was a troop of Simons. Uh, during the afternoon, there appeared as if by magic from one end of that ridge of hills to the other, a long line of black men in skirmishing order advancing at a run. It was a grand sight and they never uttered a sound. I defy the men of any British regiment to keep their intervals so well at the double. On reaching the brow of the hill, the centre halted. Then the Zulus, of whom there were some seven or eight hundred, turned. Uh, for what reason, I cannot say, unless it was to tempt us up the mountain into a trap and, and, and slowly retired, uh, leaving only three or four men visible. After that, of course, uh, Major Dartnell began to send messages back to Sandwana suggesting that he was probably in touch with the main Zulu army. General Lord Chelmsford, receiving those messages, immediately decided to join Major Dartnell on the following morning. And he also decided to take with him over half the force that was encamped here, leaving behind, as commanding officer of San Juana camp, Colonel Pelain of the 24th Regiment. What had Trooper Simons wondered about the Zulu tactic way down there to the southeast? Unless it was to entice us up the mountain into a trap. Well, perhaps the Zulus were even cleverer than that. And I believe they were. I believe that they had hoped to achieve exactly what was happening. Split Chelmsford's column. At about six o'clock on the morning of January the 22nd, Lord Chelmsford, with his half of the troops, left San Juana camp and eventually joined Major Dartnell those ten miles over here to the southeast. This now large British force made contact with small groups of Zulu warriors who withdrew from confrontation even further eastward. Chelmsford followed them for some two miles, remarking, Zulus are cowardly. Back here at St. Juana, at about 9.30 a.m., a Colonel Durnford and 450 mounted pursuitos who were fighting with the British, plus a rocket battery, yes, a rocket battery, arrived from Rourke's Drift. Colonel Pelain said to Durnford, I am sorry you have come, as you are senior to me and will, of course, take command. I am not going to interfere with you, and I am not going to remain in camp. I am going out to intercept any Zulus who might be moving in Lord Chelmsford's direction. 
And at about 11 a.m., Danford and his pursuitos rode eastward, searching for the elusive enemy. But towards midday, one of his detachments under a lieutenant roar strayed northward onto this plateau. They peered over it, and what they saw was a staggering sight. Below and beyond them were between 20 and 30,000 Zulu warriors. Most of them were squatting in silence. The Zulus saw the British scouts, and immediately the Umsitu regiment, all young warriors, rose to their feet and moved towards the horrified Lieutenant Raw and his men. The vast army began to form itself into its traditional tactic. The massive center moved towards the north of San Juan. The right horn stretched out towards the west of San Juan. And the left horn streamed southward, which tactic endangered Colonel Durnford and his men. Meanwhile, Durnford and his force retreated back towards San Juan fighting remorselessly all of the way. But his rocket battery was only able to fire once before the Zulus were on it, slaughtering the white men and the black men. At last, Durnford and his Basutos reached this donga, this dry watercourse, and here they made a fighting stand. <laughs> One soldier who survived the Battle of Sandwana, Captain Penn Simon, stated, the whole range of hills, the Nakutu, the whole of its length of four and a half miles was covered with black masses before they began to descend into our valley. Lieutenant Smith Dorian said, the Zulu army moved steadily on to where the 24th were lying down covering the camp. The Zulus were giving vent to no loud war cries, but to a low musical murmuring noise, which gave the impression of a gigantic swarm of bees getting nearer and nearer. This was the awesome sight that faced Private Owen Ellis from Carnarvon in North Wales and Private George Morris from Pontypool in South Wales. We can only guess at their thoughts and wonder if the Tory Prime Minister Disraeli or Bartle Frere entered their minds. All we do know is that they, together with their other Welsh countrymen, stood and fought. A Zulu named Melika Zulu described the initial impact of forces between the 24th Regiment and his people. I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. The soldiers poured into us a regular hail of bullets which stopped our advance. All we could see to fire at was a line of white helmets. The firing got more furious until it forced us to retire. At this moment, a warrior leapt forward and shouted back at the Impi, Mameshan! Hingalogotinvale! King Ketchawayo has not ordered us to run away! And at that timely reminder, the highly drilled, brave Zulus surged forward again. It was now about 1 p.m. and there was an eclipse of the sun. Whether either the white soldiers or the black soldiers were expecting it, I do not know. But suddenly the glaring African sun faded. It must have been an ominous moment. A Zulu warrior has said, the sun got very dark like night. The tumult and the firing was wonderful. Every warrior shouted Usutu as he killed. For the remainder of the battle, 
And indeed, for about three hours afterwards, the moon was between the sun and the earth. And at the same time that the sunlight dwindled, a dreadful event occurred. The northern angle of the British line broke under the Zulu pressure. Why did this happen? Because so few white men survived the Battle of San Juan, it is impossible to be sure. The Zulus began to shout, you may shoot us down, but we will trample you to death. Ammunition in that British firing line was running low. In many cases, there was nothing left except the bayonet. Back in the camp, uh, Lieutenant Smith Dorian began to smash ammunition boxes open and was promptly accosted by Quartermaster Bloomfield, who barked, for heaven's sake, don't take that man, for it belongs to our battalion. Smith Dorian pointed to the waves of charging Zulus and said, Hang it all, Quartermaster. You don't want a requisition order now, do you? A few minutes later, Quartermaster Bloomfield was shot dead while handing out ammunition, uh, presumably to soldiers of his 2nd Battalion of the 24th Regiment. Someone shouted at Smith Dorian. The game is up. If I had a good horse, I'd ride straight for Peter Maritzburg. The lieutenant did have a horse of sorts, and he lived on. To become a general in the First World War. Another survivor stated that he heard bugles sound the retire. Other reports place the blame on the Natal native contingent, ill armed black mercenaries fighting with the British, breaking and running. But whatever the truth is, the British line broke and the vast Zulu center tore in at the gap. The Zulus threw their rifles away and gripping their stabbing assegais began to shout their triumphant battle cry, Usutu! Usutu! The Zulu in Duna of the Amsitu regiment said, The red soldiers killed many of us with their bayonets. When they found we were upon them, they turned back to back. They all fought till they died. Not one tried to escape. A trooper Stevens recorded his last memories of San Juana camp. I stopped in camp as long as possible and saw the most horrid sight that I ever wished to see. The Zulus were in the camp, ripping our men up with their assegais. They were not content with killing, but were ripping our men up afterwards. Never has such a disaster happened to the British Army. battle exploded against the British, Colonel Pelain addressed two officers, the Lieutenants Coghill and Melville of the 24th Regiment. You will take the Queen's colour and make your way from this place. The Lieutenants Coghill and Melville rode over the neck and carrying their precious banner, they charged through the slaughtering Zulus. Coghill and Melville were last seen here, in the shallows of this Buffalo River, which to this very day is known as Fugitive's Drift. All around them were Zulu warriors. Lieutenant Coghill was heard to shout, here they come. Melville replied, I'm done. I can't go any further, but they managed to scramble halfway up this cleft. And here, they both died.
A Zulu warrior remembered the very last soldier to die at San Juana. In Dodge, as a Balazanjan, he says, I go find out. The man struggled on and on, retreating higher up the hill till he reached a small cave into which he crept and with his gun kept off his enemy. He did not blaze away hurriedly, but loaded quietly and killed one of us Zulus with every shot. Till at last, a number of Zulus were brought up with guns and they fired simultaneously at the soldier and killed him. The eclipse of the sun over San Juana ended. For all we know, that last man to die was either Private Ellis from Carnarvon or Private Morris from Pontypool. If he was not, it is certain that he was one of their comrades. There had been 1,774 men on the British side at San Juana. After the battle, there were 1,329 dead. And of those dead, over 600 were soldiers of the 24th Regiment. And what of Lord Chelmsford? and the other half of the 24th Regiment, now some 10 miles down here to the southeast. Well, during the morning, while having a meal, Chelmsford received a dispatch from Colonel Pellane, who was, of course, over there at the fatal camp. Sir, a report has come in that the Zulus are advancing in force from the left front of San Juana camp. Lord Chelmsford, no doubt still nursing the delusion that the main Zulu army was in his vicinity, merely sent two officers to the top of this hill, and they peered at San Juana camp through a telescope. The officers reported, It seems all right, sir! A little later, however, another Britisher looked northwestward, and saw what he thought was a shadow around San Juana. And then he noticed the sinister fact that there was no cloud in the sky. At 2 p.m., General Chelmsford received another piece of information. It was explicit. Sir, they say the camp is attacked and surrounded. This advice that lethal last prevailed upon his lordship to move himself and his soldiers back to San Juana. The rank and file of the 24th Regiment were boldly informed you are to march back to camp. But then the ominous rumour passed from soldier to soldier. One of them remembered. We marched as hard as our legs could carry us. It would be impossible to describe the anxiety felt by all ranks. How eyes were strained towards the camp. How long those miles were. An officer, a Captain Lonsdale, was alone and ahead of this relieving force. I approached uh, San Juana that we had so lately left, but being three quarters asleep, I did not notice that anything was amiss until I was well inside it. First thing that uh, woke me up and put me on the qui vive was a Zulu coming for me with a stabbing assegai already red with blood in his hand. I glanced around me and became instantly fully alive to what had taken place and that the camp had been taken by the Zulus. Uh, saw it all in a flash, turned and fled. Now, 
Uh, many Zulus are becoming alive to the fact that an enemy and a white man was among them rushed at me, yelling and firing. Now, as you know, uh, Kaffirs are uncommonly fleet of foot, and it was two or three minutes before I was clear of those howling devils. It seemed to me like two or three hours. When I rode up to uh, General Lord Chelmsford and reported what I had seen, I believe he thought I was mad. What Lord Chelmsford actually replied, Captain Lonsdale, is also recorded. Uh, Lord Chelmsford simply said, I can't understand it. I left a thousand men to guard the camp. The general, understandably, was in a state of shock. And in actual fact, he had left not 1,000 men, but 1,774 men to guard the camp. Private John Price from Clan Vice, South Wales, described what then happened. General Chelmsford formed us up and told us that we would have to take the camp at the point of the bayonet, and we shelled our road up to the camp. We arrived in it about nine o'clock at night, and all the tents were burnt down to the ground. And where we had to sleep was a very uncomfortable place amongst the dead bodies all night. Tell Harry not to enlist for God's sake, or he will regret it. Of course, by the time Private Price was on this neck of San Juana, all the Zulus had departed, that is, the live ones. The records of the 24th Regiment inform us that it was a night of incessant alarms and scares, a line of ill-omened beacons, the flames of burning homesteads, marked the Natal border. And when a great burst of flame arose where Rourke's Drift was supposed to be, many thought it had shared the fate of San Juana camp. And what had been happening here at Rourke's Drift? Well, at about midday on the 22nd of January, some of the soldiers of B Company, 24th Regiment, heard the sound of field guns being fired over there to the east in the direction of San Juana, some six miles away. But uh, Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead, the company commander, didn't hear those guns because he was deaf. Indeed, that was probably the reason why he had been left behind here in comparative safety. So it had been thought. Indeed, it is interesting to consider who exactly had been left behind at Rourke's Drift and why. There were 130 white soldiers here, but 28 of those white men were sick and had been placed in a small improvised hospital which had been part of this isolated mission station. Therefore, there were about 100 fit white soldiers, mainly Bromhead's men of B Company, 24th Regiment. Early in the afternoon, three horsemen crossed this Buffalo River and rode into Rourke's Drift. And one of those horsemen shouted, The camp at San Juana has been taken and all our men in it massacred. No power can stand against the enormous number of Zulus. The only chance for us all is immediate flight. Well, Lieutenant Bromhead had to make a difficult, quick decision. Either the small garrison could attempt to flee into Natal, or it could prepare to fight. His senior officer, Lieutenant Chard, Royal Engineer, was down at the Buffalo River constructing ponds, floating bridges. 
Lieutenant Bromhead made up his mind and gave orders for the defense of Rourke's Rift. And, of course, he sent a message of warning to Lieutenant Chard. One of the defenders of Rourke's Rift, a Private Henry Hook, said, Our orders were very simple. We were never to say die or surrender. Protective ramparts were hurriedly constructed from the military supplies and wagons that lay at Rourke's Drift. A private of the 24th Regiment stated, The mealy bags were good heavy things, weighing about 200 pounds each. The biscuit boxes contained ordinary army biscuits, so they would stop anything. Everything that could be done in the time was done. Deaf Lieutenant Bromhead and Lieutenant Chard ordered the soldiers to their allotted fighting places, and then they gave the final direction, fix bayonets. At five o'clock that afternoon, a soldier shouted some famous information. Here they come, black as hell and thick as glass. Three Zulu regiments attacked. The Utulwana, the Udluku, and the Indla Yengwe. There were probably between 4,000 and 4,500 warriors. The Zulus first appeared from around this eastern end of this Oscarbeg Hill. A private Henry Hook, who came from Monmouth, described the first assault. The Zulus came on at a wild rush. And although many of them were shot down, they got to within about 50 yards. Then they were caught between two fires, that from the hospital and that from the storehouse. And they were checked. Then the main weight of the Zulu force appeared and swung around the western end of the hospital and then hit the weaker northern defences. A soldier has related, up came their reserve and they were on us. The place seemed alive with them. No further orders were given to us, uh, every man to act as he thought proper. And I had the satisfaction of uh, seeing the first Zulu that I fired at roll over at 350 yards. After that, my nerves were as steady as a rock. I made sure almost before I pulled the trigger. There was some of the best shooting at 450 yards that I have ever seen. Then the Zulus concentrated on attacking the hospital, still containing soldier patients who were seriously ill. Helping to defend it was Private Hook. The hospital was a queer little one-storied building, and we were pinned in it like rats in a hole, because all the doorways, except one, had been barricaded with mealy bags. I had charge with a man that we called Old King Cole. Cole kept with me for some time after the fight began, but then he said that he was not going to stay. He went outside and was instantly killed by the Zulus, so that I was left alone. It was impossible to do anything except fight, and I blazed away as hard as I could. A helpless patient was crying and groaning near me. The Zulus were swarming around us, and there was an extraordinary rattle as the bullets struck the biscuit boxes queer thuds as they plumped into the bags of mealies. And then there was the whiz and rip, rip of the assegais. And in my room were nine sick men. At last, the Zulus managed to set fire to the roof of the hospital. Suddenly, in the thick smoke, I saw John Williams. And above the din of battle and cries of the wounded, I heard him shout, The Zulus are swarming everywhere. They've dragged Joseph Williams out and killed him. A big Zulu sprang forward and seized my rifle. But I tore it free, and slipping a cartridge in, I shot him point blank. 
Time after time, the Zulu seized the muzzle and tried to, and tried to tear the rifle from my grasp. And time after time, I wrenched it free because I had a firmer grip than they had. All this time, John Williams was getting the sick through the hole into the next room. John Williams and Robert Jones and William Jones and myself were the last men to leave the hospital. I took my new post where two men had been shot. The hospital was now all in flames, but this gave us a splendid light to fight by. The excitement of the Zulus was so intense that the ground, the ground, fairly seemed to shake. Then they would hurl themselves at us again. By this time, the survivors of the small garrison had retreated to the redoubt around the store. Private Hitch of the 24th Regiment, who was not a Welshman, said, about a quarter to seven, I was shot from the left. I knew at the time that the ball had passed right through me. I fell down and uh, Mr. Bromhead, he said, uh, mate, are you hit? And I said, uh, yeah. I crept to the rear and uh, kept going as best I could, serving the others with ammunition until I became exhausted through loss of blood and I fell down then uh, unconscious. Midnight came, and there was another great Zulu attack. It was repulsed. Then from the darkness could be heard rhythmic war chants, fighting war chants. That is how the night passed. On this very piece of ground, at seven o'clock on the morning of January the 23rd, 1879, Colour Sergeant Bourne of the 24th Regiment shouted, Stand to! To the weary, bleeding soldiers. The Zulus massed down there to the southwest and then, in their own manner, quietly disappeared. The survivors of that night at Rourke's Drift waited and waited. And then, at about 8 a.m., men emerged from the east. It appeared to be a fearsome sight. Many of them were wearing red coats, and the garrison of Rourke's Drift dreaded that they were the main Zulu army wearing the clothes of their victims. In actual fact, it was General Lord Chelmsford and his retreating column. Captain Henry Parr was with them. Uh, soon we saw that the post at Rock's Drift was on fire and uh, we feared the worst. We, we expected to find a repetition of San Juana camp. But as we came in sight of the, uh, of the commissariat stores, a cheer sounded from the top of a wall of mealie sacks from uh, a man on the lookout and it was immediately taken up by the remainder of the little garrison. Out of the 100 defenders of Rourke's Drift, 17 were killed and 10 were wounded. The dead are buried here. Of the surviving soldiers, most of them suffered black bruised shoulders because of the continual brutal recoil of their rifles. And they had burnt hands because the barrels of those rifles became almost red hot. So it was said. How many Zulus were killed, no one will ever know. 351 were buried outside this place that first afternoon. And what of the surviving Zulu warriors and their king, Kechawayo? The Impis returned to the king's royal crawl here at Ulundi and, saluting, paraded before him. As the last of them went by, Ketchawayo demanded, And why don't the rest come before me? 
It was only then that he realized the appalling losses that his people had sustained. One Zulu simply said, there are not tears enough in my country to weep for the dead. Aziko is Nyembez, is a Nel, is in love. Uli Lela was a Bambi, the Bago is him cool. And a Sergeant George Smith wrote from Africa to friends at Tredega in South Wales. There are a good many left in Wales to mourn for the loss of a loved one. Black or white, Zulu or Welsh, the sentiment was much the same. Some seven months later, after the British army had been grandly reinforced, the Zulus were finally defeated here at the Battle of Ulundi. It would be wrong to assume that the best fighters won. It would be more correct to accept that the most efficient weapons were victorious. The king of the Zulus, Ketchawaya, was captured, and he briefly summed up the British Empire. First comes the trader, then the missionary, then the red soldier. And what of sophisticated Disraeli, the arch-Tory? He made a highly inaccurate statement here in London. I am glad to announce the glorious defense of Rourke's Drift, which proved that the stamina of the English soldiery has not diminished or deteriorated. Well, with all due respect, no Welsh person likes to be referred to as English, and so I am glad to report that Disraeli then took poorly and uh, retired to his bed for three weeks, muttering about this unhappily precipitated Zulu war, the evil consequences of which have been incalculable to this country. Well, the consequences for Britain were not entirely evil because shortly afterwards they caused Disraeli to resign. He moaned, I am greatly stricken. Everyone was congratulating me on being the most fortunate of ministers. Then comes this horrible disaster, isn't Luana? Yuck. However, all was not total discredit on the political side. The grand old man, William Ewart Gladstone, the liberal personified, answered back, Disraeli's policy is pestilent. What was the crime of the Zulus? 10,000 have been slaughtered for no offence other than their attempt to defend against British artillery, etc., with their naked bodies, their hearths and homes, their wives and families. To call this policy conservative is, in my opinion, pure mockery and abuse of terms. Whatever the motive may be, it is in its result disloyal. It is in its essence thoroughly subversive. Disraeli is trying to lead the British people along a road which plunges us into suffering, discredit, and dishonor. Out of the small group of survivors of the defense of Rock's Rift, no less than 11 were awarded the Victoria Cross. More than have ever been won before or since in one military action. And that includes the two world wars. Oh, 
and the Queen's colour, which Lieutenants Coghill and Melville tried to save from the Zulus, was eventually recovered from the Buffalo River and in due course was hung in Brecon Cathedral. Here the 24th Regiment is religiously remembered. Let us remember before God and the commander to his sure keeping those who have died for their country in war and all who have lived and died in the service of mankind. After the massacre at San Luana, the Zulus composed a battle hymn in praise of their king, Quechawayo. Thou, the great and mighty king, thou hast an army. The soldiers came, we destroyed them. The mounted soldiers came, we destroyed them. Thou, the great chief, thou who hast an army, when will they dare to repeat their attack? Hawks drift to look back to the year 1879. It all started a hundred years ago with the Zulus resisting British domination, and it ended with the British destroying the Zulus as a nation. Saint Luana was the first of the battles, and one the British lost. 1,500 British troops, mostly men from the Welsh regiment, the 24th, faced 25,000 Zulus. By dust, the British were annihilated. 858 died and nearly 4,000 Zulus. Today, to the music of the Natal Carbineers, whose regiment was with the British forces, wreaths were laid at the foot of a San Luana mountain, one wreath from the Royal Welsh Regiment. Many Welshmen of the former 24th Regiment had flown from Britain to see the battlegrounds. Our, our own day, it's our regimental day, and uh, one which we honour throughout the regiment. I think it may be starting all over again behind you. <laughs> the Zulus today were dressed exactly as they were in 1879. The colours of their shields and the different headdresses indicated the separate regiments. And watched by their king and their paramount chief, Gacha Butalesi, they reenacted their preparations for attack. And on the sidelines all the time, they were encouraged by their women and a bevy of young Zulu maidens. If Queen Victoria and her subjects safely at home were not amused by the British defeat at Asandlawana, Rourke's drift made them feel much better. 
Here, 120 men of the 2nd 24th repulsed an attack by 4,000 Zulus for a day and a night. They came over the hill as a Welsh lookout shouted, Watch it, lads. They're as black as hell and as thick as grass. Rourke's Drift made British military history and 11 Victoria Crosses were awarded. <laughs> This evening, on a rock, overlooking the battle plains, buglers sounded the last post. And the dead of a hundred years ago, British and Zulu, were remembered and honoured. Michael Nicholson, News at 10, in Zululand. But a few days later, a small British unit at Rourke's Drift Missionary Post made a stand against 4,000 Zulus, killing 500 of them. The few Rourke's Drift survivors were showered with honours, including 11 Victoria Crosses. A hundred years later, John Humphreys, our Southern Africa correspondent, reports. The Zulus lost the war a century ago, but are today the most powerful black tribe in Southern Africa, because there are more than five million of them, and they outnumber every other tribal grouping, including the whites. United, they pose a real threat to the survival of white domination in the long term. The Zulu king was here, but more important, the prime minister, Chief Gacha Butalezi, who has probably the greatest following of any political figure in South Africa today. They took this occasion seriously, because it was here the Zulu warriors inflicted on the redcoats the worst defeat in British military history. More British officers fell here than at Waterloo. Not one white man was left alive on the plain of Isandlwana. The next battle after Isandlwana was Rourke's Drift, where the Zulus suffered a terrible beating. And then later, Olundi, the battle which effectively crushed the mighty Zulu war machine. So Isandlwana was not only the Zulus' greatest victory, it was their last. The Zulus are engaged in a different kind of fight now to win back some of the independence and self-respect they had a hundred years ago. Butalezi refuses to accept the form of independence offered by the South African government. And although the Africana government talks of reconciliation, when I spoke to Butalezi, he made it clear he does not reject the alternative of revolution if they cannot win what they seek by negotiation. We are at the crossroads. It's either that, in fact, in concrete terms, the, the, the reconciliation that we are seeking you know, uh, actually um, materializes or else God, God help us. The British were represented here today. It puzzles the Zulus that the British beat the Boers as well as themselves, but it's the descendants of the Boers who hold all the real power in South Africa now. Butalezi has said if his people fail to win a share of that power peacefully, he might one day expect the British and the West to help. And if there is to be another war between the Zulu and the white man, the British should be clearly on their side. Well, that's the news on two for tonight, but just to recap on tonight's main...